Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, closing session this, this afternoon. Um, I know you have seen some very exciting presentations and have learned many new things during the day. But I can absolutely assure you that as we move into this session, you're going to be engaged, involved, and informed by a fantastic panel that we have for you this afternoon. We have the mayors of two great cities, Claudio Orego, uh, who is the uh, mayor of Santiago, the intendente mayor of Santiago, and Rui Morera, who will close the session uh, before we move into a, a panel discussion later on, uh, who is mayor of Porto. We have Margaret Newman, who is from the Municipal Art Society. Now, I'm from the Royal College of Art. I should have introduced myself, uh, Nicholas Leon. Um, but, um, so we have two artists, but not really. Um, Municipal Art Society looks after all aspects of urban design and urban planning. And uh, prior to that, um, Margaret was, has taken a wonderful journey. She was chief uh, of staff for New York's transportation and there to the Municipal Arts Society, so quite some, uh, quite some change. Um, in charge globally of the smart cities for Oracle, Imke Itzing. So we have our uh, technology sector with a real strong focus, also augmented by Sean O'Brien, who is the Global Vice President for Public Sector for SAP. Uh, a fellow academic like myself, but one who also has been uh, an entrepreneur, and I know we will not be able to keep him in his seat this, uh, this evening, uh, <laughs> uh, Jerry Engel. Uh, Jerry is from the uh, University of Berkeley, and uh, Rui Morera completes our, our lineup. Now, the, the topic we're covering is the role of technology in social development. And as cities are increasingly the hubs of innovation, those cauldrons of creativity for the knowledge economy, what is it that cities can be doing to prepare themselves? What is it that they can be doing in terms of technology? What is it that they can be doing in terms of programs, of citizen engagement, to make sure that the process by which innovation takes place in the cities is inclusive? What methods? What processes can they do to make sure that it is democratic and that citizens are involved? That's the, the heart of what we're going to be discussing today. And leading off on that is Claudio Orego, who will give his, his thoughts, particularly with a view of the challenges of social segregation in a world where disparities of incomes are perhaps greater than ever. So, Claudio, please, the stage is yours. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, in order to have smart cities, you need to have smart citizens that are allowed to participate and smart leaders that are willing to listen. Um, I come from Santiago, uh, a wonderful city with lots of strength, seven million of people living in one area of Santiago, of Chile, sorry, where 66% of the commercial and recreational revenue comes from, and 85% of the services of the country. A city that has a wonderful uh, landscape with the mountains, but also that has a, a call, a, a very uh, loud call for inclusiveness. President Bachelet said that an inclusiveness city is a right that we have to fight for. And why social cohesion and inclusiveness is so important in Santiago and in Chile right now? Because after that very powerful city, or behind it, with a double click, you see the disparities, the most unequal city of the country and the region of the country. The dark spaces in this map of Santiago are the poor neighborhoods, and the light uh, yellow one are the rich neighborhoods. People don't live uh, close to each other. And if we, when it comes to green areas, green area square meters per inhabitant, you have areas of the city where you have 18 to 20 square meters of green areas for inhabitants, others with one meter square meters or less. 
how can we go about uh, addressing these challenges of uh, unequalness in a city like Santiago? I think technology can help, but it has two ma main requirements and basic requirements. One is participation. I strongly believe that participation is like a, a box full of different tools. Uh, if you only have one hammer, every problem seems like a nail. Uh, there are not only one tool for addressing participation. You need many different tools. One is listening, like surveys. Uh, we do in Santiago surveys every, uh, every year in order to seek what people are thinking. But then people want to be involved in shared design of policies. So we do open uh, spaces where people can come and contribute to, with their ideas to our main problems. People want their ideas to be implemented. That uh, picture over there in the right-hand corner uh, is the Mapocho River between, in between Santiago. And the idea is to have a, a bicycle tour uh, in it, which is a citizen's idea that we're trying to implement. We completely, uh, we, we very strongly believe that authority has to be on the ground, on the field, to see the problems by themselves, allow citizens to make decisions, and to have online accountability through the uh, uh, social networks. But participation is not enough. You need leaders that are able to address these issues. Robert Dan Moss from Harvard University used to say, building a network of computers is an act of technical expertise. By building a network of people, is an act of leadership. Uh, for a city like Santiago, many metropolitan cities in, around the world, uh, you need strong leadership and governance. First, to make people dream in a better future. That hill over there is, the, is one of the hills in Santiago. We have 26 hills that we want to make uh, green parks for the country and for the city. You need to coordinate with different mayors. We have 34 different mayors within Metropolitan Santiago. Uh, and of course, technology can help. And then you have crisis management. Last Friday, I almost didn't make it here, three lines of the subway in Santiago stopped. And we have half a million people walking in the streets. Uh, you can have all the technology in the, in, the, in the world, but if you want to lead a city, you need to live with that type of crisis. So when we think about Smart Santiago, of course we think, as many cities in the world, of trying to improve the quality of life of people using ICTs, information technologies, to in enable citizens to participate in the science of how they want to live in a city, fostering deeper coordination and collaboration among, among both public and private institutions that govern Santiago. In our plan, we have six key areas of our smart city program for Santiago. One, the main concern of citizens when you go to the field and when you ask them in surveys is public safety. Even though we're the safest city in Latin America, it's still people feel afraid. And we have some drug problems, and we have some violent problems. People are saying, how can you help us using technology to have better understanding and better, uh, uh, more safer neighborhoods? We have a, a system of transport where we have a metro system that is not integrated with a bus system, a loss not in the management. In the payment system, we are, but not in the management. So how can we help using technology to help people to increase the usage of public transport in the country? 50% of the, of, the, of the transport in Santiago right now is by private cars. And that is increasing as, as Chile gets better uh, and more uh, rich country. People want to buy their own car. And we know there's no solution just by using private cars. There's not enough space, there are not enough streets. So what we need now is to increase the quality of service, and technology is helping doing that. If people will know how much will it uh, take them to go from one place to the other in the city, if the service will be better to coordinate different uh, types of transports, of course we will have a, a better and increasing usage of it. We need to improve our environment. Santiago has a lot of pollution, especially in the winter. 
How can we measure that pollution? How, how can we lower the emissions of cars and also of industries? I think and we think that technology can help us. We have 345 local governments in the country. Uh, now we have created some special applications for one of them. Why not replicate them throughout the country? For example, for public works uh, departments in municipalities that can make it cheaper, more transparent, and, less, uh, and, uh, and with less time to have the permits in a country that needs to do building and, and public works and housing uh, more fast. We are developing a strategy throughout the country to massify this strategy. And then we know and we believe that Santiago and the government has tons and megabytes of data, uh, gigabytes of data, terabytes of data that is not using, that is just storing in a very secretive manner. Why not open that, that data so private sector developers, citizens can use it to help us build new applications for a better, better government? In 1872, that was the center of Santiago. That hill called Santa Lucia is now looks like the one in the right hand. It was because people were willing and courageously enough to think the impossible that they made things possible for Chile. We think that a smart Santiago, more equal, with social participation, with social cohesion, and with very clear and strong leadership, is possible. We think that technology can help us achieve that goal, and we're sure that we're going to make it. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Those kind of key points of participation, collaboration, creating that social cohesion, and the role of leadership. Margaret, the stage is yours now. So, Thank you, uh, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much, and I'm really pleased to be here in the city of Barcelona, which I truly love, and uh, I'm very honored to be here with my fellow panelists. Um, I, as um, Nick mentioned, I'm an architect by training and with about 20 years of private practice in New York, and I'm currently serving as the exec executive director at the Municipal Art Society of New York. Prior to being there, I was the chief of staff at the New York City Department of Transportation. So I've worked in between the government, with government, uh, for government, uh, and also with private sector clients. So I'm looking at this from a number of different points of view. So the Municipal Art Society uh, is a 120-year-old nonprofit organization based in New York City, and we're based. Uh, we're dedicated to shaping the future of New York through urban planning, policy, and civic engagement. And the organization was started by a group of architects and planners and artists who were worried about the effects of industrialization on the developing urban and spatial city back around the turn of the last century, uh, from the 19, 18th to the 19th century, and the term municipal art was understood to refer to architecture, planning, and public art. Today, as we've been talking about most of the day, we're both celebrating and concerned about the effects of technology on our cities as a tool, as a change in the way we build, and as a change in the way we communicate. Our work at MAS includes everything from we are advocates, consultants, think tank, policy experts, and planners. And we, it includes everything from maintaining the city's monuments and murals to advocating for government reforms that protect and enhance neighborhoods to walking tours and events that promote quality urban design. I'm going to be talking today about a few projects that we're working on at MAS, projects which help to ensure that New Yorkers are driving the discussion about the design and development of their city. The four projects are examples of civic engagement to make social, economic, and urban development more democratic and collaborative. First is a, a series of projects around something called the Accidental Skyline, which represents an online engagement tool which responds to particular development concerns in New York. The second is Rebuild by Design, which represents civic leadership and convening around an environmental crisis. Third, our Livable Neighborhoods program, which represents educational workshops and training. And fourth, our Penn Station work, which represents our goal to spark innovation and propose designs for modernizing our city's outdated infrastructure. 
So first, the accidental skyline. In New York City, we have a complex zoning plan. Some types of development are subject to a public process. Other types can take place without any process whatsoever. An example of development without any public process is um, when a, you can purchase air rights or development rights from neighbors and build a skyscraper that is out of context, as shown here, without the public ever being aware of what is going on in the neighborhood. MAS launched an online tool that shows exactly where these rights are available for purchase, and the tool informs the public of potential development before a shovel hits the ground, empowering New Yorkers so that they are not taken by surprise by new development. The tool has also served as a call to action for our elected officials who expressed an interest in closing the loophole in our zoning through legislation. And it's been very, very popular around New York, and uh, is, I urge you all to go try it out. Another example of our work is on Rebuild by Design. In 2012, Hurricane Sandy ripped through the northeast coast of the U.S., causing extensive damage. It was the second most expensive natural disaster in U.S. history, costing the country approximately $700 million. The dest destruction from Sandy raised issues that were too big, too complex, and too interrelated for any one organization to fix. There was real concern from communities impacted by Sandy that they would not be part of the process of building back and building better. MAS facilitated and led a coalition of over 500 organizations, 180 government agencies, and 140 neighborhoods through the Rebuild by Design initiative over 18 months. None of that would have been possible without the help of technology and communicating through online tools. Local coalitions develop fundable, implementable solutions which inform new policies at every level of government. To better plan for protection against future storms, the federal government sponsored this competition uh, for design solutions. This is an example of one of the solutions which brings together different subject matter experts. And one of the teams uh, built something, designed something called oyster texture, where landscape architects use oyster farms to build ecological defenses against tidal surges. Another, MAS, another tool that MAS uses to engage New Yorkers is our Livable Neighborhoods program. We kicked off this program in Brownsville section of Brooklyn, New York, which is home to a high density of public housing and many lower income residents. This program offers New York City specific workshops on a range of planning topics, including community organizing, the use of census data to understand neighborhood concerns, explaining zoning res regulations, and drafting comprehensive development plans. Created in consultation with grassroots planners and community advocates, the program is free and open to the public, with special preference given to members of community boards, community-based organizations, neighborhood associations, and other grassroots community groups. Uh, the program is available both online and then it's done in in-person in, uh, in -person workshops. Lastly, I want to talk about planning and design advocacy, and a visioning project for New York City. New York City's Penn Station is the busiest transit hub in the Western Hemisphere, and some 640,000 people move through the station each day. That's more than New York's three airports combined. And it's a long story, but the original train station, which was grander and larger, was destroyed in the 1960s. Vincent Scully, an architectural historian, described entering New York through Penn Station as one used to enter the city like a god, now one scuttles in like a rat. And this is a picture of the current Penn Station conditions, which are often quite crowded and unpleasant. So just a few weeks ago, MAS worked with architects in New York City to imagine new possibilities for Penn. And this to created, this created a lot of conversation around town, sparking new thinking about the possibility of what could happen at the site and bringing the public interest to the forefront of that discussion. There's a report that's issued online which describes all of the visioning for that project. And the, this is a, uh, an image by the Woods Bagot team, uh, which is one of the designers that worked with us to, to envision what a new Penn Station could look like. 
As you can see, MAS looks to engage the public regarding key decisions that are impacting their city, online and offline. We are there to bring a diverse network of people to positively, positively impact New York. Thank you very much. Margaret, th thank you very much indeed. I mean, the, the key points I kind of really focused on there was that important role of using the technologies for communication, for civic engagement. Um, I've never heard the term oyster texture before, and I think you heard it first here. And also the kind of the importance of the role of design, uh, not just to give people inspiration, but also as a kind of source of, um, of collaboration, co-design, co-creating with people. So with that in mind, now we turn to technology. Imke, um, who I should remind you again, is in charge of smart cities globally for Oracle. So Imke, the floor is yours to uh, connect us with technology and people. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for um, having your time at this time of the day. Uh, but also thank you. I'm looking at faces of many, so many of our customers. So also thank you for being a customer of Oracle in local government in cities around the globe. I'm running smart cities on behalf of Oracle, and I'd like to introduce you to the role of technology in social development. So much about the role of technology. Um, and, and certainly, I mean, I won't go into depth when it comes to inclusiveness and transparency and open data and what have you, but just to set the scene, um, there is a big responsibility on the shoulders of cities around the world to make sure that everybody is included, that everybody is part of the game, so that you develop, let's say, whatever your responsibility is in such a way that nobody is left behind. And when it comes to nobody left behind, it is all about making sure that you understand what the citizens need, but also that the citizens need what, are, what they are eligible for. But also, it should be clear um, what the city is about, where the tax money is going. It should be transparent. It should be helping citizens to understand um, uh, what the value is of, of what the city is bringing, but also what their rights are, what the uh, responsibilities are on both sides of the equation. So you'd better be transparent. You'd be open. You make sure that bottom line numbers add up. And whether that is about fighting corruption or whether that is about democracy, whether it's about making sure that we are all on an equal uh, uh, level playing field. Um, everybody has its own motivation, but transparency is quite key. And immediately, when it comes to transparency, I'm thinking about technology, about the tooling yeah, that makes transparency happen. And nowadays, with today's communication um, uh, capabilities, we can, we can do so. And I guess it's true in the Western world, there is just no way out anymore. We need to open up data. We need to open up data to deliver this transparency. But it's also fair to say that it only comes when it is available 24 by 7, when it is secure, when it is transparent. I mean, you can open up data, but you, if you're not able to kind of responsibly report on the use of that data, then you run into trouble. So there is, an, again, uh, an increase of responsibilities on the shoulders of uh, cities. And the same would be true for crowdsourcing. I mean, everybody talks about crowdsourcing, and obviously, during this conference, uh, at the exhibition area, it's all about uh, grasping the creativity of the crowd, making sure that everybody basically tunes in to what is necessary to increase the, the quality of life. Also here, I see a big role of the cities themselves to facilitate, to help that dynamic process of, uh, of the citizens. And citizens group themselves into new communities. They find each other in, 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 in new peer-to-peer -peer teams. People start to create a community to produce their own distributed energy. They use uh, solar power and other renewable energies to basically become an energy production entity. So you see a shift from the, citizen, oh, sorry, from the city and the utilities into uh, the citizens. The same is true for public safety or public transport for that matter. So you see new ways of finding solutions for day-to-day -day, uh, activities. And we no longer only look at the government or the local government or the city councils. No, you see citizens, communities take and pick up their own responsibility again. And what would it be nice if cities would support those initiatives? And this is what we see happening all over the world. So rather than just focusing on the internal operation of a city, 
trying to organize the city as an entity itself, we see that thanks to technology, things are opening up. The cities become more and more in the mode of collaboration, harmonizing processes, making sure that the data infrastructure is there. But we also now see cities reaching out to the public, reaching out to the citizens, the businesses, and of course the Internet of Things. And that leads to an enormous opportunity of ingestion of data, be it from sensors, be it from human beings, lots of information that if you operate on it in a, in a sensible way, you make the quality of life better for everybody, both internal to the operation and to the larger ecosystem of, of the city. But having said that, it does require that you interact, that you integrate, that you exchange. So it's not without reason that I'm saying getting to that next level of maturity does require a solid platform, a solid basis or backbone, if you will, on all this level to make these things happen. And you better do it right, because otherwise, you know, you set the expectations here, and if reality is there, then the whole idea about citizen engagement falls apart. And no surprise, we are in this business of providing those, those platforms. And just to talk to three use cases, think about a social city, cities that care about the people that are able to reach out to the people that need social care. So what about using those same platform elements to reach out to the homes, to make sure that the caregivers are in contact, closed loop, with the caretakers, that you measure what is happening, the sentiment, but also perhaps remotely through remote devices. What about education? When it comes to social development, why not and make sure that people get access uh, to uh, the educational institutes, get access to the infrastructure, that you share your research information, that you open it up. And the same is true for healthy cities. And the list goes on, and I invite you to uh, listen to more examples back at our booth. And it, 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 it covers elements and discussions like public health, fighting poverty, uh, but also revenue management, how to get more revenue into the city, how to make sure that citizens are more compliant, how to make sure that you can pay the sustainability of a city. And I found an interesting uh, study of almost well, this is over 20 years ago where you see this interaction between what is needed on the side of the city and what the citizens should provide, or vice versa, the expectations of the citizens and the businesses and that what is necessary on the side of the city. And I tried to simplify that model by just picking uh, five elements that make up new functional requirements. You need to make sure that you inform the public up to the moment that they feel responsible and are empowered to collaborate. And if you do the functional decomposition of what is needed to make that happen, I mean, you end up in particular areas that we can talk, to, talk about in detail, but whether that's sentiment analysis or whether that's just plain portals or whether that's knowledge management or whether that's location-based services, in the end, those are the building blocks that can help you as a city to become more um, uh, in a better position to facilitate customer or citizen engagement. And we can talk about it along the lines of the, the, the elements that I procedures in here. Just three examples from the real world. Uh, Transport for London sits on an enorm enormous amount of data. Millions and millions of rows of data are ingested about everything that moves in the city. They provide a platform to distribute the data to the crowd to the people that want to subscribe to that open data. So they provide the facilities, and it's the crowd, it's the citizens, it's the businesses that build on that data. Same is true for New York, with their transparent dashboarding, with their crowdsourced big apps contest, where they rely on a backbone that is uh, built upon by the crowd. And final example, Singapore, they sit on the cadastral geographical information, a very solid backbone, but they allow the people to create extra layers of data, informal data, on top of that backbone. So again, in summary, cities, I guess, are uh, there to provide the facilities, to entertain and to help the creativity of the crowd, of the businesses, and to make use of the Internet of Things in a much better way. Thank you for now.
Imvigay, again, thank you very much. I, th I particularly like that chart that shows how we translate all that technological capability into real value in the model of how we engage citizens. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Sean, um, again, a reminder, Sean, who's vice president, global vice president for SAP, responsible for the public sector. So another view, this is the, the, the core ICT bit of our s social development side right now. So, Sean, over to thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. So when I was asked to join the panel, um, it's a, such a broad subject, I, I kind of thought, do we cover, I've got nine minutes, now I've, I'm told eight minutes, but I had nine minutes. I thought, well, do I cover nine topics one minute each, or do I cover three topics three minutes each? And then Nick told me that it was eight minutes. So I will try and, and navigate this very complex uh, approach. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's the wrong, wrong presentation. There we go. Uh, do I get a bonus point for egg bonus time? You're very kind. So, you know, it's, it's very late in the day, and, and your generosity is, is fabulous. So I wanted to talk really about three, three things. Uh, the first thing is SAP has a program called Urban Matters. We chose not to focus on smart cities because cities have been smart for centuries, and smart is part of everything a city needs to do, but we need to think holistically about the challenges that people have. So the first thing I would like you to sort of think about is you need to orientate yourselves for a digital urban world. So when you think in a city, in a regional government, in, a, in the private sector, you need to think about the profound changes that are happening in technology and the impact that has on your citizens, on the businesses, on the public officials that you have. And at no time in our history, I, I've worked within government, I've worked uh, uh, in terms of delivery with government, I've worked with a variety of cities across the world. And the thing in the last few years that is very, very distinct is at no time in our history have we had a convergence of so many factors from the demographics, the urbanization, the economies, through to the change in technology. So what's different? Uh, the first thing is consumerization, the mass consumerization of technology. It's mainstream. People joining the workforce have more computer capability than ever before. So the consumerization of ICT changes your thinking. The sex second thing is the user experience. People want a great user experience. If you don't give them that user experience, they go elsewhere. And government needs to think about that user experience. The third thing is immediacy. We want it now, online, on demand. Social media, network, when you shop, when you watch a video, when you see content. This immediacy is a key issue. And when we think about the urban challenges and how governments deliver services, immediacy is a key issue for them. We need to think about the social aspect. Millennials will make buying decisions based upon their social network groups. So we need to think about this social experience, this conversation that cities have with their cities, with their actors, with their uh, citizens. We need to think about the engagement. People want a service customized to them, personalized to them. They want that individual experience, and we need to think about that. The channel. We need to think about how people choose to consume and engage in cities, the different channels that they have. We need to think about the business models, so cloud, services, cloud-based services, how people consume technology is very different. Uh, we need to think about the service that we deliver, easy, quick, tailored to me, delivering what we need. So the first thing is, when you think about social development, you think about developing your city, you need to put it in the context of what's happening in the real world, how digital technology is changing, how it's accelerating, and how the people that work in your organizations, the people that visit your city, the people that transact in your city, they have a different expectation of how the city should serve them. The second point I would make is you have to broaden the agenda on the social development. So we, we as an organization have reorganized the way SAP focuses on regional, local, and city government because the conversation is different. And what we have is we've created something called a, an urban value map. And this value map is available. If you Google it, Urban Matters Value Map, it's online, it's available. And what we've done is we've looked at the common themes that the mayor has 
on his or her agenda. Improving livability, transforming the city, driving economic prosperity. And what we've done is we've identified some of those key themes, like you have to, do you have to be good at governing, you have to empower communities, you have to have a safe and resilient city. And we've identified these common themes that really help address those issues. The other thing that the mayors will often say is, I don't have a switch and tomorrow I'm a smart city. It's an evolution. It's a marathon. It's a very complex set of problems. So when we talk to technology companies, can you identify specific scenarios or particular problems that we have at this time so that we can address those and deliver something quick and of value that allows us to carry on our journey? So I'm just showing you now one example of a customer in it's the city of Boston. They've been very focused on a program called Boston About Results. If you Google Boston About Results, it will take you to this interactive scorecard. And one of the things they've been trying to do is bring the citizens into the city process. How is the city performing? How are we engaging? Is it relevant to you? You know, be involved in that process. Be involved in how the city's performing. Let us know how, where you're headed and why you're headed there. And so this is a screenshot of an application that's been live for some time in Boston, where all the information on how the city's performing, how they're delivering value, is available at the touch of uh, citizens' fingers. So they are bringing the reality of how you're performing, how you're not doing so well, to the citizens. And this is one important part of engagement. The third point I would, I would sort of raise is Technology is nothing, it is everything. So think about the technology value. When I deploy technology, what value does it bring? How does it deliver? So in Boston, we deploy technology to reduce crime by 55% in their problem properties. In Pune, we deployed mobile technology around their green spaces to improve the green spaces and sustainability of the city. In many parts of the world, in Buenos Aires, we provided technology to improve how they manage their infrastructure. In Puebla, we created technology with the mayor to deliver new services. So across the world, we have about 2,000 urban organizations we're working with. And often, their problems are slightly different. Their challenges are different. Their focus is different. And they want someone who can focus particularly on that problem. But it always has to relate back to what's the outcome, what's the value. So just sort of four takeaways as I finish, hopefully on time is leadership, strategy, and outcomes matter. So when you think about social development, think about that. Social engagement is a key aspect of that. How we, you know, in Mexico, in Brazil, in India, we're doing things around social sentiment. So what's the voice of the people? What are they thinking? How can we influence uh, our policy making? New skills and tools, very important. We've worked with a lot of businesses, like the Colombian Coffee Farmers Association, or the Ghanaian Nut Co Cooperative or lots of other small businesses. We're building skills for the Colombian coffee farmers so they don't have to go into the city, that they can get the best price for their coffee, they can focus on farming, is a really, really good way of social development, helping small businesses to have the right schools, the right tools, and government can play a role in that. And good governance. So when I talk to many cities in Latin America, in Asia, in Europe, in Africa, they say we have to do the basics really well. If we're not running our government institutions well, if we're not running the city well, how can we be expected to execute on our strategy? So thank you very much. Uh, I'm done. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and I particularly love that chart, that ending chart. I think every technology company should uh, see if they can license that from you. Starting with the outcomes, focusing on social engagement, recognizing the importance of skills. And those are some of the themes I know we're going to cover with Jerome. Now, here comes Jerome. Jerome is uh, not going to stand behind the podium, I know. He's going to march up and down this stage and engage you. Um, from the University of Berkeley, or Berkeley, I should say. Barclays, Barclays Square in London, of oh, course. Thank you so much. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jerry Engel. I'm from the University of California, Berkeley. And I do want to welcome you to a great panel because we've been talking about using technology. And I've learned a lot actually sitting on the panel thinking about how we'd use technology to be open, to be collaborative, to create equality, to create design so we can participate in the creation of great cities. I know nothing about that. 
but I do know something about how to create cities that create value. Now, do we have my slides? Yes, these are my slides. Fantastic. So every city likes to have an image of itself. And this is a self-image of my town. And my town is actually Berkeley. And you wouldn't even find it on that map. It's in the far right-hand side. But why do I say this is my town? Because my town doesn't view itself as a city. It views itself as part of a region. And that region's name is tied to what it does well. The region's name is Silicon Valley. And you might look at this map and say it's a bunch of businesses. Or you could look at another self-image and say it's a bunch of leaders. So is your city the businesses in it? Or is it the leaders? Of course, it's both. The key element of this is how we vision the ability to create value. I said I don't know anything about how to consume and you know, use technology, but I do know how to work with entrepreneurs, because this is what I've done for all my professional life. And when we create cities that focus on entrepreneurship and innovation, we create these images, these maps. Well, this is a map of Barcelona and how it views itself relative to innovation. What would we see if we looked on that map? We would see the components of a knowledge economy. And I want to propose that these different components, whether you're in Barcelona or Tel Aviv, are made of, of people and people on the go. Mobility. When I came back to my hotel in Tel Aviv the other day, this is the sign I saw on the wall, and that's what told me I was in a cluster of innovation, not the map with the entities on it, but a simple sign that told me, geeks welcome. You know, And that said to me, in this town, being a geek or a knowledge worker is cool. And then I knew I was in a place that valued that kind of creativity. Well, at universities, like the place I'm from, Berkeley, we used to think innovation looked like this, or economic vitality. And we'd say cities were places that clustered around industries. And I want to suggest to you that that's no longer true, that cities are places that now cluster around a new point of view, which is an innovation view, and a way to use mobility and economic power of the individual's creativity to create new enterprises that disrupt the incumbents. In other words, disrupt those that occupy the space that provides us the goods and services. Why do we want to disrupt them? Because their business is to do today what they did yesterday, and to do it the best way possible. And the entrepreneur's business is to bring you something new and edgy. And then the incumbents embrace that, you know, maybe acquire that business and bring it to you in scale. So these are, these are economies that focus on the knowledge or the university or the stakeholder employing the entrepreneur to exploit that technology getting the financing behind it, and the secret sauce is to get the major corporations, those people I call the incumbents, the secret sauce is they're really great partners, and to get them engaged, and then to support them with an entire ecosystem. And we can talk about economic ecosystems for more than eight minutes. We're not going to do that now, except to say that economic ecosystems can have different shapes and different looks. They don't look the same, but what they do look similar in is the type of pace of change that they want to create. And they want to be on this steep part of the slope, the magic zone of innovation, where change in a little bit at a time is creating massive impacts in terms of user benefits. Everybody wants to be in that space, but everybody can't be there. Universities don't belong there. They're creating knowledge, which is much harder, slower task. The entrepreneurs, the gazelles, the venture capitalists, they belong in that zone. And the major corporations need to help those entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and innovators climb up the scale. So everybody wants to be in that zone, but not everybody can be there. I lived through these changes in Silicon Valley where I saw this march of innovation. All these new industries emerge over the last 30 or 40 years. I've helped a lot of these businesses evolve just out of the benefit of being there. And what I learned is that the engine of change is the individual entrepreneur and the entrepreneurial team. And cities can be the force that make this you know, ecosystem function because they can create the kind of environment that supports the collaboration between those that have the money, those that have the technology, 
and those that have the capability and desire to put it to work. So in this new world, we have five types of behaviors. I won't take you through them now. I flash up a picture of the book. Go buy it. It costs too much. It'll tell you all about it. The, the outcome, I would tell you, though, is that when I came to Barcelona the first time, my friend Joseph Piquet drew this chart for me. He said, Jerry, I want your help. And I said, what, what do you want my help with? He says, well, I want you to help us start a new economy here in Barcelona. And I said, well, you know how to do that. You're, you're more, actually, you're more successful here in Barcelona in creating successful businesses than we are in Silicon Valley. And because, in fact, I drew that little chart. I saying up and to the right, you, you have fewer failures you know, per startup here than we do. And he said, yeah, but look at the top of the chart. They peak out at 20 to 100 employees. He said, you, your ventures are much higher risk, much more failure, but they tend to have a, you know, when they're successful, they'll have 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 employees. He says, so that's what we want to build here in Barcelona. And I've been working with him for the last five to seven years in, in building like a 22 at, if you know that in, in involvement, you know, in building opportunities for people to build businesses of scale. So the only final point I want to leave you with is that cities don't have to do this alone. They can do it as in collaboration with other cities. So it's not like we used to take the regional view and say, okay, every city has to have everything. If you're an entrepreneur in Barcelona, in Barcelona and you're great at design and you're the, you know, the home of Gaudi and you have all this great intellectual uh, talent and you, know, you have other great partners locally but you may be missing some components, reach globally and be born global initially right from the beginning. And that's the thing our mayors can do. They can start and help support entrepreneurs, reach globally right from the get-go. So, the entrepreneurs are the heroes, technology is the driver, but local capabilities is the foundation, global interconnections is the secret tool, and major institutions like universities and major corporations and governments have a role to play. And let's hold them accountable and put them to work. That's my message. Jerry, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> so there we are, clusters of innovation, not just of industries, interconnected globally, filled with leaders and individual entrepreneurs being the driver behind all that. And we as cities, we as cities, it's brilliant. We, we, we're just like gardeners. We have to cultivate the garden that allows all of this to grow. So Rui, I'm going to now hand over to you, our closing speaker, and it is a privilege to have you here this afternoon. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure being here. I know I'm the last speaker. I'm, I'm had to listen, I listened with you to fantastic, amazing speakers. It makes life difficult for me. But I will try to remember that one year ago I was an underdog in an election which I managed to win, so maybe I can end up uh, attracting your, your attention. Uh, of course, eight minutes is not much, and I would like to tell you a lot about the city of Porto. But I think um, with limited time I would tell you that there is one word about the city which I think everyone recognizes, which is resilience. And why do I mean that? Because despite the crisis we have gone through, not only globally, not only in Europe, but also in Portugal, we have managed to keep a budget which is balanced, and the city is showing at the moment uh, sustainable growth. Uh, in the, this year, we have reduced in 8.5% the debt of the city, and um, we are increasing public investment by almost 9%, which shows something is working good. And how is that possible? Through, obviously, sustainable management of the city and of its resources, but also through tourism. We have been growing in tourism at the rate of something like 15% per annum. And, of course, this has been a, because of that, we have been able to avoid the problems of the shrinking internal market, which everyone knows has happened in Portugal with loss of consumption of our people. Uh, we have won the European Best, Best Destination Award, so we are quite happy at the moment, but we are facing a difficult moment. As you know, tourism is a very important tool for cities, but it's also a very dangerous tool. It is a very dangerous tool because if it's not managed properly, it leads to ghetto cities, it leads to gentrification of the cities with the, the local citizens being expelled, and at the end of the day, it's a sort of golden egg because you end up by killing the kitchen because the, the chicken because after a while every tourist that will come will say what 
difference does this city make from any other, uh, any other city? So the big thing we have been working on is how to develop the city, use the tourism, use the influx of investors which come to build hotels, to develop other tourist activities, and yet not lose the characteristic of the city, this charm of the city. But at the same time, being a tool, we use the tool for a certain purpose, and we have defined and we have decided what do we want, what do we exactly want, and we thought what we want is an inclusive city. Everyone wants an inclusive city, I guess. But more than that, we want a city that has to be comfortable and interesting for its citizens. And being comfortable and interesting for its citizens, it's certainly going to attract also interesting visitors, because that's obviously what we want. What we also thought is, what is the inherent tool we have? We have good weather, but we are not um, destination people look for because of the sun. Uh, there are other cities like Barcelona, which are probably more attractive. We don't have as many uh, uh, tourist attractions as Barcelona. What do we thought that we can bring together is culture. Why? Because first of all, Porto being a very bourgeois city has always been very cosmopolitan. It develops culture, it wants culture, the people want culture, that's what people want. It brings social cohesion because Culture is a little bit like going to a soccer match, you know. When we are watching something, we are all equal. We, we don't feel the social difference, it's very important. But also it's very important from the point of view of the tourists we want to attract. And of course we have these resources with the architecture of Porto, with people like Caesar or Sotomoro, who any of you may have heard of. So this, this has been our idea, and at the same time we thought, how, if, if we talk about so social cohesion, how can we do more without the help of central state? At the time when in all Europe uh, our central states are investing less on the social welfare of its citizens, how can a city progress and go back to its roots? And what we thought is, we still have the same roots, the roots are society, the NGOs, the churches, all sorts, citizens, associations, all that. And that's what basically we have been trying to do, which is extremely different, difficult, and extremely different from what has been done before. Uh, but we can't stop with, uh, with culture. We need, as said, when we think about interesting and comfortable cities, obviously we have to think about the future. What do we want from our cities? And that's where the universities play a role. That's where our new startups play a, a big role. That's where our new policies which we have been developing with local companies and also with foreign companies plays a very important role. What we want to use the city is basically as a living lab. We have the advantage of being a small city. We are only 42 square kilometers. Uh, we only have 250,000 inhabitants in the city itself, although the metropolitan area is 1.7. So we think what we are trying to say is we are offering the city as a tool. We have the university, we have a very good uh, engineering um, faculty, we can attract companies who, lo who look for engineers, and we can ask them, why do you come here to try and attract our engineers? Why don't you come and live in the city? Why don't you start the, your own business in the city? I think this is one of the viable tools for a city to develop. But we have done more. We are using also a very interesting and very important tool, which is our multimodal transport network. And that's one of the things we really have. We have a great, a, a great port. We have a very good airport. And then we have a transport network which uh, allows people to travel with a single car, with metro, bus, a train, and even use a car sharing service. We are now also working on, on the bikes, uh, which is one of the matters which probably has, will be discussed during these days. And we are trying to use this, all these resources to turn the city into a real economic ecosystem, which is obviously what we want from the cities in, in the future. Uh, in, in terms of new companies, what we have found out is the crisis has opened a new uh, opportunity. What we found out that is that young people who basically wanted to work for the government, wanted to work for the city, wanted to work for the big, uh, for the big um, banks, these days what they want is they want to be entrepreneurs. That's what they basically want, they want to do. That's a huge opportunity. And what, what we want to do, obviously, and what we have to do, and I think all the mayors that are here will follow me in this thing, thinking, is since we can't invest like we did in the future, no matter where we are, 
what we can do is work on turning and transforming our cities into fertile territories. So basically, I see myself a little bit as a gardener every morning when I stand up and I look at the city and I think, ultimately, what I have to do by the end of the day is help turn this property, which was handed over to me for a limited period of four years, into a more fertile soil, into a fertile garden. And eventually, if this works, uh, I think cities will develop and will have a bigger role in the future than they had in the past. Because the policies of central governments, unfortunately, they have very often failed to understand the differences between cities and the opportunities of governing people near their homes, near their problems, and near their opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs> again, we, we, we covered the importance there again of social development, of um, is tourism the kind of Trojan horse or is it the engine for uh, renewal and innovation? Is the role of the mayor to be the ultimate gardener? You know, creating a fertile territory for entrepreneurs to grow and innovation to flower in those cities. So these are just some of the topics we've discussed. Now, ladies, gentlemen, I, I have a, a, a few topics before we open up to our audience here for questions. And the, the, the thought that's been on my mind as I've kind of listened to these are, Really, what is the, this challenge of leadership? I'm going to ask the mayors this one first of all. It seems that the, the role for a city leader is a, is a different one in this era of transparency, of, of big data, of open data, of empowered citizens and um, communities, all empowered because some of the technology is making that possible. So, what, Claudio, first of all, perhaps you, what, what, what do you think in terms of the, the new role of leadership? And Rui, then I will turn to you. Well, I, I, as I said in my presentation, I think we all have this dream that we can have a shortcut to good governance and to improve the quality of people, which is just to put a software there and then the software will play itself by magic. Yes. But then when vendors like Oracle and SAP go to an institution, be it public or private, they realize very shortly that unless the leader has the vision, unless the leader is committed to whatever they want to do with technology, uh, it's going to be very uh, uh, difficult to implement. So I always wonder why our IT projects and smart city projects invest so much money in hardware and software and so little in training and mentoring and coaching leaders in different levels of institutions in order to make those things happen. I, uh, I'm convinced that uh, you can have weak technology and a strong leadership, and many things can happen. Uh, whether you can have the best technology <laughs> in the world, a very weak leader, and very few things will happen. So I'm not saying that the vendors have to I mean, make leaders uh, appear. I just think that we have to put more attention to how can we develop these different type of leaderships, how cultural change in institutions, yes. and how collaboration is so critical, and the vision behind that collaboration. So when you put software and hardware there, it, it will you know, fit into a very neat plan for a concrete vision, rather than just having a technology as an as a end itself. So I don't know, I, my way of saying is, when I try to implement a smart city program in Santiago, I have four city councillors that are with me here. I, you know, oh, on I the front in, row here. Uh, they're in the front row here. Hi, guys. I, I, from different parties, <laughs> uh, uh, opposition and, and, and government. So I, they I, can ask some difficult questions of They, they will, moment. for sure. But you know, the <laughs> thing is, unless you bring them in, you know, political leaders, senior leaders, uh, all the technology in the world won't help. Okay, Rui, your, your thoughts on this kind of leadership and uh, the, the impact of technology on that for you? I think technology, first of all, allows the citizens to uh, get more involved in, their, in the daily process of decision making. Yes. And, and that's what citizens want. I don't mean direct democracy will be the future, I hope not, because I think it will be just a step from populism or dictatorship. But I think we have to recognize that citizens these days, be it through Twitter or the Facebook or whatever means they have, they, want, they, they are more aware they can even work out on their network of information 
or disinformation sometimes, they can, <laughs> which is, again, uh, dangerous. Absolutely. But at, at the end of the day, they want to be part of the daily decision-making. So I think we are uh, living in a world where the old uh, leaderships uh, are disappearing, where the concept of the old, um, if you want, traditional representative democracy has to be adjusted to this fact of life. A and these democracy. people are looking for leaders everywhere. They are looking for leaders in the NGOs, in the universities, in the colleges, in the street, everywhere. And, and, and it's, 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 it's an amazing new world in a way, because these days, for us mayors, we have to sit uh, daily with people who we hardly recognize and who come to us and they bring new ideas and in fact they represent new groups, not only pressure groups, but really people who have special concerns. And they become new leaders. And I think that's also happening with business, with entrepreneurship, with the startups, with the university. These days, we talked a lot, in the, 20 years ago, we discussed how can government, business and universities work together. These days, we, we work together. There is no other way. You see, <laughs> something which was a, a problem, which, which always caused us to concern how can we manage, it happened exactly because of these informal leaderships. It was not because of the formal leaderships. And do you think there's a role also for the citizen beyond decision-making as well, for communities to deliver services sure. increasingly? And they do. I think and they, they do. do. I think they do every day, you know, through, through the NGOs. In Europe, especially with the social welfare shrinking, you see more and more citizens doing what previously the state did. In many ways, like it was before the Second World War. Yes. Because we are rediscovering that sort of citizenship, you see. So it's nothing really new. It's, in fact, it is an old tradition which was lost. It was lost during a time when we thought social welfare will take care of everything. You see, and now the citizens are again awake and they want to participate, but they don't want to participate like they did in the 20s. They want to be more active because they can interconnect. They, do, they don't need to connect through us, through the formal ways. They can interconnect in an informal way, and that's amazing. So we've got this new engine for service delivery as well as for decision making. Now, guys, from the technology side, I'm going to ask you both to reflect on this. It does seem that the last decade has brought so many technological changes from social media, big data, mobile everything, Internet of Things, smart sensors on everything, that it's quite hard for cities, it's quite hard for enterprises, even the most sophisticated, to digest all of that. What do you think that we can do to help the cities digest these types of technology so that you get not just smart technology but the kind of smart services that can enable them to create value from this? Yeah, happy to take this one. And I think I'm building on your comments. I mean, um, it is difficult if you use your words, but we have so many brains uh, around in the city. So it's all about collaboration and using the brains and the capacity, the creativity of of the people and the businesses, the entrepreneurs out there. And I think that that is part of the answer. And I think when it comes to leadership, it's about delegating that portion of the uh, ownership back to the citizens. And again, like you said, they are ready to, to go. It's a matter of providing the foundation and then let the creativity and the, the crowd, let the, the brains of the people do the job. They take the leadership if you give them the right to do so. It's a shift of responsibilities back to the society again. Um, that we indeed forgot about over the last decades. Yeah. Thank you. And Sean, do you, do you have any observations on that as well? Yeah, I mean, two or three. I mean, I think the first thing is it, it, it's the third discussion. So just tracking Twitter here in the panel, you know, trying to find out what people are feeling, what they're talking about, is, is, is something that we, we need to sort of think about in, in these kind of discussions. So I think the first thing is we talked about this immediacy. We talked about this relevance of discussion and topic. And I think that's an area that we need to think about. I mean, many of our customers, they, they focus, on, focus on tangible outcomes. So in Pune, municipality of Pune in India, they wanted to do a tree census of all the green spaces in the city by tree, by type, and they couldn't do it on paper. So they went straight to mobile technology to take a picture of the tree. They put it into a real-time analysis so they could see all the green spaces, all the trees. They could improve their tree management. Um, and we see lots of examples of that where relatively small pieces of innovation delivered very quickly, but changing the way technology delivers value 
to those organizations. In, in Buenos Aires, an interesting project when I, when I met the sort of city, Mayor Macri, uh, they, they used to get 100,000 calls around problem with the infrastructure in the city, and they would re resolve very few of them. Uh, they put in new technology to, to improve that, and now they have 250,000 calls, and they resolve 80 plus percent of them, and now they're looking at how you connect up sensors and real-time data, so when they have flooding, they can reduce the flood, therefore the congestion in the city. So always thinking about some of the traditional ways of solving problems and some of the new technology, I think, are great examples. Okay, thank you. now just picking up on some of the, a couple of points of Jerome and, and also of Margaret, you know, in, in an era of austerity, when there is, you know, major issues of employment in our cities, and that we need to have real civic engagement on issues like that. Is, is it enough just to create things which are just around the entrepreneurial model? I'm, I'm picking up Jerry's comments here with very strong focus on entrepreneurship as being the driver, but, but I think you, you, you've been working on other kinds of projects yeah. here, Margaret. I, I, th I think that um, you ask a really great question, one that I think is really um, very uh, kind of relevant in what we're talking about in New York right now, which is that all of the technology and communication allows people to talk to each other. And you mentioned Twitter, and you know, we just did a conference in New York, and there were it, it reached several million people, by the, and it was only 400 people at a conference. So we know the message can get out, and we know that we we had a joke about uh, the transportation planning in New York when I was working there. That New York City has eight and a half million residents, and it also has eight and a half million traffic engineers. <laughs> so we, we would have people commenting all the time. So I think the conversation goes on. The, the, the fact, though, is that we all still live in a physical environment. Yes. We live in a spatial city. We live in a built city. And I think we haven't quite reconciled how to take care of that environment in a way, how to pay for it, how to plan it in a way that engages citizens in, in, in the way that it should. So I think we have a ways to go. Um, and I think that you know the entrepreneurs are certainly um, building back parts of the city, and in, in their, there's funding that's coming in there. But I think we, we have a long way. And I think mayors certainly um, provide incredible leadership, and that's where the, the innovation needs to be in planning our physical environments. So uh, Jerome, or Jerry, I should say. Jerry, is there a place for social entrepreneurship then in this model of... Uh, drivers yeah. for innovation. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, let me just say, a theme I'm hearing from across the panel is that innovation really comes from the edge. In other words, that there's only so much mayors can drive and control, that the citizenry is really uh, the power force, that our technology providers are very interested in opening the communication channel to enable that. The, the innovation that you were using to monitor the uh, activity level was not an innovation brought top down by a major corporation, but bottom up by some idea that guys had six years ago and now is omnipresent. My point is that social, you asked about social entrepreneurship, whether it's social or just strictly commercial, this is all happening on the edge and coming in and affecting us. And uh, the caretakers of the core, the mayors, the governance, the major corporations, we have to take care of allowing this innovation to happen. And I think it's happening whether we, we want it to or not. So we better ride that wave and enjoy it. Excellent. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, Sean, you want to come back on yeah, this point, and Claudio as well. Sorry. Well, I just wanted to say uh, that here in uh, Mayor from Porto, I, I, I thought of three concepts that are right now kind of in, increasing in, in our debate. One is online accountability that for, you know, for mayors and businesses is so difficult right now because you have to be on top of your toes all the time. They will just tweet, they will send a picture, and that's a huge challenge. The second one is open innovation. In the past, if you were a good Democrat, you will hear the people and then go back to your office and say, now I have to think over what solution I need for that problem. Now you have tools, now we're working with the World Bank, trying to have an open innovation uh, methodology where you will put up the public problem and then Invite people, you know, from the private sector, from citizens, to give you the ideas and to be kind of partners with the public sector to solve that. And the, the third thing is integration. Uh, in the past, we did everything physical contact. Now we think, some people think we can go all digital. I think it's a mix between click and mortar, you know, physical and digital. Your head always thinks where your feet are. 
So you have to be in the field, but then <laughs> you can tweet, you can use technology, you can uh, deliver services in a very integrated way. Uh, Sean, I'll give you... Very quick point, Nick, is um, this wearables, telemetry, trackable devices, this Internet of Things is really cha changing things. So we, we created a very unique piece of technology about in memory called SAP HANA, and the German football team uh, brought this real-time a tool so they could analyze telemetry, where the footballers are, how they interact with each other. So we're often thinking about innovation, but in the business context. You know, the, the, the young, the innovators know how to apply it to a business context, but technology companies need to bring that technology forward to allow that to happen. And as being, a, being a, someone from, from Great Britain, I, you know, Germany winning the World Cup is always painful for me anyway. I, I was going to say it's kind of ironic. You're <laughs> hearing from the, an Englishman all about the... <laughs> <laughs> about the German football team and the remarks uh, and their capacity to use the technology more effectively. Uh, I, I think we are seemingly running out of time, but I think we might be able to take a couple of contributions or questions from the audience. Yes, uh, gentleman at the back, you're going to have to speak very loudly, sir. I don't know if we... Oh, no, please go to the microphone by you. Right, Thank well, you. Microphone just here. Um, well, it's, it's been quite interesting, the discussion just now, and a number of topics has been uh, raised. And um, it seems that the panel um, have a, a common question, which is that uh, we understand that cities are in transition at this moment. I mean, cities for the 21st century are completely different to the ones that we have uh, been accustomed to. But uh, we have a problem that hasn't been really raised, and that is the problem of urbanization. And it happens that, according to the figures, that the, the growth of cities are going to happen in the developing world. And in the next 25 years, we're going to have cities of... Uh, uh, 20 million in about 100 cities or so, with the 9 billion that's going to be in, in, in the planet for that time. So all what has been uh, discussing here is uh, talking about and uh, taking, taking some analogy from the computers. It's about the software of the city, that is communication, that is governance, that is citizenship and so on. But uh, it seems that uh, no one has been taking the, the, the point in, what about the hardware of the city? How is going to be the city uh, uh, the format of the city, the, the, the way in which the city is going to be built in the next century. And uh, what about the human scale? What about, what about the, 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 the citizenship in the sense of livability of the city? So I think that that is going to be really the key question because the city are going to be, uh, Claudia, the, the city that are, we are designing now is going to be the city that's going to be living in the next 50 years. So well, I'm going to ask Claudio to uh, respond, I think, as a, a well, mayor. I, I think more than a question, is kind of a statement uh, that I share. Um, however, I think one of the problems that we're facing, not only Latin America, but also uh, in other parts of the development world, is that uh, we have a model where we segregate the city, not only on social terms, but also on functional terms. So we have the industry on one side, then we have the commerce in another side, and then people start living in the edges of the city, and as the city increases, you have more transport problems, more uh, pollution problems. H how can we think a new type of city in, in those places uh, where things are more integrated, where you have commerce and living spaces and also parks? And also, I, I think we have to rethink the way we construct cities, because in the old way, uh, in cities with 20 million people, I mean, uh, not only is it going to be too expensive, but also it's going to be very difficult to have that human scale and good quality of life uh, uh, city uh, unless you are able to rethink it in a different way. That would be my thought. I don't have the clue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is there another question here as well, sir? Yes, I, I just uh, had one contribution and thought on the leadership question that you asked at first yes. of the panel. <clears throat> my name is Macon Coles, and I'm on the Boulder City Council in Colorado, the United States. And it, it seems to me that the, the leadership that we need and visionary leadership across the globe is, is leadership that reflects the core values of the people. And this is why, actually, that, that so much of the interesting action in getting us, moving us towards sustainable cities, um, in reducing the metabolism of the cities so that the cities can provide people with what, what they need and a good life and the energy to drive our businesses and all of that, that it can be done without destroying the planet. The, this visionary leadership is found at the local level. 
And, uh, and it is the cities that are the leaders uh, with the innovators in the private enterprise and the federal labs and the universities and all of that. What one of our biggest challenges at the level of the cities right now is to change some of the legal infrastructure that, and, and also some of the, uh, the profit incentives, frankly, with the large corporations. They can be good partners, but as we see in the energy industry, the, the dominant corporations in producing energy are doing it in a way that's destroying the planet. So the responsibility that local leaders have is to uh, try to break through some of these barriers, some of the legal infrastructure that is an impediment to our, our getting to a new type of a world where we use more renewable energy, where we use uh, energy more efficiently, so that we'll have a, a, a planet that exists in a, a fine form for our grandchildren and our descendants. Well, th thank you very much indeed for that contribution. I'm now going to draw this to a, a, a close. I'd like you to join me in thanking a panel which I think represents all of the different disciplines which are certainly going to be necessary to create the cities of the future. We have the technologists, we have the city leaders, we have the world of art and design, and we have the world of entrepreneurship. And to have a smart city clearly needs a lot more than just smart infrastructure. It needs smart services, smart people, and the coming together of all of the elements that I think you, you see here on the stage. So thank you very much. It's been a privilege to be able to chair this panel this, this evening. And thank you, our audience, for staying with us through the, this afternoon. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.